in this passage every morning. So please do keep that passage open and let's hear from God's word together. There are so many questions that we can ask, but one big question that each one of us here ought to ask and ought to know by the end of this camp is one, and that question is, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Our hope is by the end of this week and by the end of this weekend, as we spend time here together, each one of us would be able to answer that question so well that each one of us will be able to understand what the gospel is all about you see dions this word gospel is commonly used and many of us here love saying that we do love listening to gospel songs we love gospel music in comparison to secular songs but what is the gospel what exactly is the gospel? What is it? Now, as many of us here might already know, the word gospel simply means good news. Yes, that's what the gospel is. The gospel is good news. But the thing is, not many of us are able to tell what this good news is all about. What is it about? What, what's good about the good news? Why is it we call gospel good news? What is this good news all about? Who is this good news for? The passage that we have just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 11, each one of us here this morning will be able to see from this passage what the gospel is all about. Yes, in these verses that are before us, they will help us understand the good news that Christians love talking about and the good news that each one of us would want by the end of this camp to be able to understand and to be able to tell any other person what this good news is about. In fact, looking at verse 1, Paul starts there as he's writing to these different people by describing what this good news is. In fact, he starts there in verse 1 by mentioning the word gospel. Look down with me. Verse 1. Now, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stood, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Just there in verse 1, he uses the word gospel. But what is it? I hope you see there in verse 1, Paul starts by telling his readers that this is the gospel that he preached to them. And then he goes on ahead to tell them that this gospel is the gospel that they received. And then he goes on to tell them this is the gospel that made you to be saved or which you are being saved. Then he goes there in verse 3 to describe what this gospel is all about. When we say we listen to gospel songs, Instead of listening to secular songs, what do we really mean? What is the gospel? What is good news? And Paul from verses 3 all the way to verse 11 tells us two things about the gospel. He tells us two things about this good news. The first thing that we see is there in verses 3 to 7. And he says this about the gospel. Number one, the gospel is the good news about Jesus. Verse 3 to 7. The gospel is the good news about Jesus. Look down with me what Paul says there in verses 3 to 5, and you'll clearly see that good news that Christians love talking about is good news about Jesus. Verse 3 to 5. For, this is what Paul is saying, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. You see, dear ones, Paul starts this chapter 
by describing what the gospel is. In fact, he says that it is the gospel that he preached and it is the gospel that his hearers received. Do you see there in verse 3 he says, that gospel is of first importance. In other words, he is saying it's something of so much significance. It's something that is so serious. It's something that you and I ought to take it seriously. It's good news that you and I ought to receive. No one is to miss it. No one is to take it lightly. It is the good news of Jesus. And what is it? In verse 3, look down with me in verse 3, Paul uses five important words to describe the gospel. Christ died for our sins. Christ died for our sins. Five words. Here is the good news. Good news for all. For me and for you. Good news for all of us here this morning. And this gospel at the core, at the heart, at the center, has to do with Jesus. It's good news for us that Christ died and that he died for our sins. Yes, good news that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. You see, those five words there in verse 3 is what the gospel is. That Jesus died, he died for our sins, and he died for our sins, according to the scriptures. So three things that we see in, those, in, in that just verse three about the gospel. Number one, Christ died. Number one, Christ died. Now, this is so obvious. Who doesn't know that Jesus died? It's very obvious, isn't it? Jesus died. He died on a cross. He was crucified on a cross like a criminal. Even when he was without sin. He was crucified on a cross even when he was innocent. As we saw in our Bible studies. You see, death on a cross was one of the most shameful things anyone could have gone through. Crosses were meant for criminals, bad people, bad guys. Wale wazi. No one good was hanged on a cross. But Jesus, though he was innocent, was hanged on one and he died. He was crucified on a cross like a thief, like a criminal. And the Bible tells us that on that ninth hour, he breathed his last. You see, Jesus could have saved himself from the cross, but he didn't. He chose to die. And Christ died and was buried. And as we see in this chapter, his death, his burial, his resurrection has a very important implication for each one of us. As we'll see in 1 Corinthians in this morning expositions, people die. Every minute people die. Why do we make a big deal about someone who died on a cross 2,000 years ago? Someone might ask. But Paul says there in verse 3, look down with me. Christ died, and people die, but he just didn't die like that. Verse 3, Christ died for our sins. The second thing about the gospel. Christ died for our sins. Now, brothers and sisters, this is very important that you and I should be able to get this right. But Christ died 
and he died for our sins. Though he knew no sin, though he committed no sin, though he was sinless, he took upon himself the punishment that sinners deserved. Even though he was innocent, he became guilty by taking upon himself the punishment that you and I deserved. And that wasn't easy, brothers and sisters. He didn't save himself from the cross, even when he had powers to do that. But he went ahead and died on the cross for our sins. He took upon himself the judgment and the punishment that all of us here deserved. He died for our sins. We were the ones to be hung there on a cross. We were the ones to die there on a cross. You and I ought to have been there paying and taking the punishment for our sins and for our disobedience against God. But Jesus went there and was crucified for us, for you and for me, for your brother and for your sister, for your mom and dad for your grandparents, for your cousins. Christ died for our sins. Five important words. Christ died for our sins. And how do we know that he died for our sins? The scriptures tell us that, isn't it? The first, the third thing Paul says there in verse 3. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Which is a bad thing. Christ died, number one. Christ died for our sins, number two. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, number three. You see, dear this is very important for us to get this. I hope you remember last night as Eric was teaching us about the Bible. We saw that the Bible reveals God to us. Were it not for the Bible, we would not know that Christ died for our sins. No wonder, when Paul is writing verse 3, he says, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. We need to read the Bible to understand that he died for us. The way we know that Jesus' death was not just another death, like many other people die, is because the scriptures tell us he died for our sins. He died for us in accordance with the scriptures. In other words, the scriptures bear witness to the fact that Jesus died for us. When he died on a cross, on Good Friday, he died for sinners. He was innocent. He committed no sin. He knew no sin. But God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. God made him who was innocent to become guilty for us. Three important things. Christ died. Christ died for our sins. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. But please note, brothers and sisters, in verse 4 and 5, Paul goes on ahead to show us that the gospel is about Jesus. In fact, what he does, he gives us more information about Jesus. Verse 4, Jesus was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After saying that Jesus died in verse 3, Paul goes on ahead to say that Good Friday was not dead. What comes after Good Friday? Easter Sunday. Good Friday was followed by Easter Sunday. Paul says that Jesus died. He died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. 
Look down with me. Verse 4 and 5. Jesus was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And from verse 5, he goes on to say, he appeared to many people. In other words, Paul is saying here that many saw res resurrected Jesus. Yes, they saw him die on a cross. Yes, they saw him being buried. Yes, they saw him after he rose from the dead. Do you see there from verse 5 that Jesus appeared to many? He first appeared to save us. Then he appeared to his 12 disciples. And then from there, he also appeared to many people. Look with me, verse 6 and 7. Then he appeared to more than how many people? Now how many people? 500 people at one time. Most of him are still alive when Paul was writing this. And some of them had died or had fallen asleep. When Paul was writing this, he's saying, if you go to your village, you can be told, James saw so Jesus, resurrected Jesus. Peter saw so resurrected Jesus. Tim saw so resurrected Jesus. But the other brothers who have already died and sisters, that you know that they saw Jesus. He died. Everyone saw him die. He was buried. We'll see tomorrow, uh, tomorrow or, or, or the day after in our Bible studies. People saw him being buried. But when he resurrected, Sepha saw him, his 12 disciples saw him, and 500 people are witnesses of his resurrection. When Jesus died, when he died for our sins, he didn't remain dead. Not at all. Rather, he rose from the grave and many saw him. In fact, we'll see tomorrow why Paul makes a big deal about Jesus' resurrection and that many saw him. Because that has something to do with our thinking of death and with our thinking of our own resurrection. So we'll be able to see that tomorrow from verses 12. But even as we wait to see this tomorrow, please note how Paul makes it clear here that the gospel is the good news about Jesus. He says the gospel he preached, the good news he preached, is all about Jesus. And it is the good news about Jesus who died, who died for our sins, who died for our sins, according to the scriptures. It is this good news that Jesus saves. That's the gospel. The gospel is nothing else, brothers and sisters. It's the good news that Jesus saves. And who does he save? Sinners. Sinners. Like you and me. And the question for us, brothers and sisters, is have we received this good news? Have we trusted in Jesus? Have we believed in him? It's a question to ask yourself. Have you received this good news about Jesus? Do you really understand that Jesus died? That Jesus died for your sins? Have you personally received this good news? Would you say you are saved? And if you say you are saved, do you understand when you mean you are saved? It means you understand that Jesus died for your sins. Do you understand that? I wonder, if you don't do that, what exactly makes you not believe that Jesus died for your sins? What makes you not believe verse 3, those five important words that Christ died for our sins? If you're here and you're not a Christian, you're not 
a born again Christian. You are not a believer. You have not trusted in Jesus. What is so hard about believing those five words? Christ died for your sins. Our prayer is lead us for you throughout this week, brothers and sisters. We have nothing else to offer to you, by the way, except that Christ Jesus died for your sins. And this is the good news. This is the gospel, brothers and sisters. If someone tells you to say, what is the gospel? It's five words. Christ died for my sins. And that it is in itself good news. Paul preached it. People received it. People believed it. He had nothing else to offer. You see, what we have to give you, what we have to tell you throughout this week in this camp is just this. That the gospel is the good news that Jesus saves. And he can save you. Now, moving on from verses 8 to 11, look down with me, verses 8 to 11, we see another important thing that Paul says about the gospel. We have already seen that the gospel is about Jesus dying for sinners. But one might ask, did he really die for me, a sinner like me, someone who is guilty? Did he die for me? And the answer is yes. In fact, a big yes. And it is yes because, as we will see from verses 8 to 11, the gospel is good news of God's grace. Verses 8 to 11. The gospel is good news about Jesus showing grace to sinners. The gospel is good news of God's grace. Now, Paul in these verses before us describes himself as a very bad man. He describes himself as a great sinner. I'm going to read verses 8 to 10. So follow me through as you look at your scripts and from your Bibles. Verses 8 to 10. And please... Note with me how many times he says he's least or worst. And also look with me how many times he uses the word grace of God. So two things you'll be looking as I read this through. Number one, how many times he says he's last of all, he's unworthy or he's least. And then look down with me again. How many times he talks of grace of God or his grace? First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 8 to 10. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, and worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Do you see here how Paul says that though he persecuted the church, though he was least and unworthy, that didn't stop Jesus from dying for him, for his sins. In fact, three times in this passage, he uses the word grace of God. Now, just in case uh, we are not familiar with this word grace, you know, we say we are from grace, Point church. But some of us here might not understand what grace is. In fact, some of us are called grace. You might think it's just someone's name. Sorry, grace. <laughs> grace is somewhere. What, what, what is grace? What, what does grace mean? You see, brothers and sisters, grace is something that you don't deserve. It's getting something that you don't deserve. Something that you don't merit. Something that is freely given to you, free of charge. It's getting something that you really don't deserve at all, or if you write something that you didn't work hard to get, like a present or a gift. 
is something that is freely given. Let me give you an instance. Maybe this might help you. Just imagine you have disobeyed your parents at home. Or you have disobeyed your teachers in school. You have done something ridiculously evil and something really bad to your parents or to your teachers at school. What you might get is punishment. Punishment for your sins. Punishment for that something that you have done. What you really deserve is punishment. Now, if you have done something bad to your parents or to your teachers, and then they come, they tell you, I'm not going to punish you for it. That's what we call mercy. In other words, you'll say, my mom or my dad or my teacher has shown me mercy. They have not given me or they have not punished me. They have not given me what I need or I deserve. But now imagine with me for a moment. They don't punish you, but they even go to an extra length of not punishing you, but they also do something that is ridiculously good. They take you out to a supermarket and buy, a, buy you a bar of chocolate. Or maybe they take you out on a holiday or on a road trip for doing something really bad. Some of you are saying, I know my mom can't do that. <laughs> if they do that to you, that's what grace is. Get in that which you don't deserve. Instead of punishment, instead of being grounded or whatever kind of punishment you get, instead of being expelled, you receive mercy. Some of you uh, last night might have uh, hid hidden their phones. Now imagine Ken getting you with a phone. Instead of chasing you out of this camp and setting you home, he goes on ahead to buy you a piece of chocolate. Then that will be grace. <laughs> something that is a free gift, something that is unarmed, you didn't work hard to get that piece of chocolate. In fact, what you did was to disobey. Something that is undeserved. You don't deserve it at all. Now, Paul in these verses, verses 8 to 11, he makes it clear that he didn't deserve Jesus dying for him. He didn't deserve it at all. Why? He says he persecuted the church. He killed those who believed in Jesus. He thus says, look down with me what he says there. He says, in fact, I am unworthy. Unworthy. I didn't deserve this at all. When Jesus was appearing to Cephas, and when Jesus was appearing to the twelve, and when Jesus was appearing to the five hundred, Paul says, He also appeared to me. Look with me what verse 10 says. I'm going to read verse 10 again. Verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Paul knew so well, I didn't deserve Jesus dying for me on the cross. I didn't deserve resurrected Jesus coming to appear to me, but he did. In other words, Paul says that what he got was God's grace. He got what he didn't deserve at all. He was shown and given what he didn't deserve at all, God's grace. No wonder some people call grace. If you write the word grace, G-R-A-C-E, going downwards, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. That God shown him mercy. God gave him that which he didn't deserve. By the fact that Christ paid for it on the cross. When this director Jesus appeared to many, Paul says, he also appeared to me. And this is the good news, brothers and sisters. Good news about Jesus giving grace to the undeserving. Jesus dying for sinners like you and I. Jesus dying for us and showing us grace. 
Let me tell you something. If you didn't fight it when you're doing your Bible study, you and I, in today's Bible study, can only be compared to Barabbas. You and I can only be compared to him. No one else in that story that we looked at today. We are those who disobey God. We are those who do not obey his commands. We are those who sin against him. But instead of us dying on a cross, Jesus took the punishment that we deserved and died on the cross. And then, even though we deserve death and eternal punishment because of our sin and because of our disobedience against God, Jesus took our place. The way he took the place of Barabbas. Barabbas, a criminal, was released. And Jesus, the innocent, was taken in. And everyone was shouting, crucify him. This is what the good news of the gospel is. In fact, brothers and sisters, this is what makes Good Friday good. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Now, before we bring this to a conclusion, it's good to ask ourselves, so what? So what are we to do about this good news about Jesus showing and giving grace to the undeserving? And the answer is right there. In this passage that we have looked at. And the answer to this simple question of, so what are we going to do about this? Tell us. The answer is there. Hold fast to the gospel and keep on believing it. So what? Hold on to the gospel and keep on believing it. You see, dear ones, our response to the gospel is one. Believing in it. And if we have already believed it, the response is simple. Keep holding on to it. This is not something that I've cleverly come up with. Look down with me, verse 2. Look down with me. I want you to look at your passage or your Bible. Look there in verse 2. Paul tells them, brothers and sisters, it's the gospel I preached to you which you received in which you stand, by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you. What are they to do? What are they to do? They are to hold fast to the gospel that Paul preached to them. This is important, brothers and sisters, because this word if shows they need to continue doing it. You hear the gospel? You don't stop there. You keep holding on to it. You don't start inventing something new and thinking, oh, yeah, the gospel is good news about Jesus showing grace to see in us. Yeah, I know that. I need something new. No, there's nothing new. Sorry. Keep on holding on to the good news about Jesus showing grace to see in us. In fact, look again with me, verse 10. Then he says, by the grace is what I am. But then verse 11, he says, whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you, and so you, hold fast to the gospel, believe it. Hold fast to the gospel, believe it. Friends, the reason for this youth camp the reason we want to spend our time with you this coming few days is none other than wanting to encourage, to keep encouraging each one of us to continue believing and holding on to the gospel. If you haven't believed in it, our job here is very simple for you. We will make it fun. We'll do different activities. We'll do different games. We'll hear different sessions. But one main thing we want you to do is believe the gospel and hold fast to it. We want to help each other, to remind each other that good news is about Jesus, showing grace to the undeserving. And we want to help each other 
in the coming few days to believe in this gospel and to hold in to it. So let me ask you as I finish. If you are here and you have not believed in Jesus, you haven't believed those five words, Christ died for your sins. Our prayer and our hope is that this come, you will do that. We want to make this very simple. We want to encourage you to speak to one of the leaders here. We'll spend the whole time with you. Just grab the hand of one leader here and ask them. Or tell them, I would want to believe this good news. And we'll be very happy to do that. To pray for you. We'll be very happy to keep explaining this good news to you. So if you have here and you haven't believed in Jesus, you haven't believed in those five words about Christ dying for you, our prayer for you is you'll be able to do that this week. And if you have done that, you have already believed in Jesus, you see yourself as a saved and a born again Christian, then the question we would want to keep asking you is, are you holding fast to the good news? Are you? Are you? Are you? It'd be good for each one of us to be able to speak to one of the leaders during this come to tell them, I think I can. I'm not sure. Pray for me. It'd be good for leaders to spend time with each one of us, praying for us and helping us to understand this good news. Asking us, are you continuing to hold on to this gospel? So may the Lord help us. May the Lord help us that, to know that Christ died for our sins. Let's close our eyes so we pray. Be grateful each one of us to spend a minute or two just thanking God for the good news that we have heard from these 11 verses. Please pray for yourself silently, everyone silent, this is serious. Bow your heads, close your eyes, pray for yourself. Pray that God will help you to believe that Christ died for your sins. Two minutes, and then I'll lead us in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the good news. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you that the gospel is good news about Jesus dying for us. We pray for one another in this room and throughout this camp that you'd help each one of us to believe it, that you'd help each one of us to hold fast to it. 
Please, Lord, would you help each one of us to understand that we are those who deserve your punishment because of our disobedience against you. And we thank you for the gospel. We thank you that Jesus died for our sins. Thank you that we who are guilty are declared innocent because of what he did on the cross. Please, Lord, help each one of us in this room to believe, to trust in him, to hold fast to this good news. We thank you that we who didn't deserve your mercy and your grace, you showered it to us, you shown this grace to us. We who would describe ourselves with the same words Paul is using here, unworthy, least of all. Please, Lord, would you grant that throughout this camp we would keep hearing these good news in these different sessions. You'd help us to believe in it and to hold fast to it to the end. For this we ask in Jesus' name.